Good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to be here in Bismarck, and thank you to the Basin Electric uh, Board, management, and members for inviting me. Um, I have to say that the combination of the governor's speech, the prayer, and the national anthem uh, was great. All we were missing was a flyover, and I would have been uh, even more fired up to be here. So that was fantastic. Uh, and it's also been interesting to participate with all of you, the board, uh, many of the members, in the last 24 hours to go and tour the DGC facility, the Antelope Valley facility. Uh, it was great to see everything happening here in North Dakota and in your whole region, and the technology uh, that's powering this country. And I think you'll see in my comments that uh, I see the world uh, quite similar to what the governor sees uh, and also what a lot of you see. But it's also my job to look at um, what other forces are out there, you know, in the geopolitical space, in the financial markets, in the economy, in the international relations. And, and what could those mean for your cooperative here? And that'll be the purpose of my discussion this morning. So I'm not an electrical engineer, I'm not a geologist, I'm not a chemical engineer. Our firm approaches these questions very much from the perspective of politics and economics. Uh, we cover about 100 countries around the world, all the major energy producers and consumers, and we try to bundle that together into a view on where these energy markets uh, are headed. Okay. Click. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I too struggle with technology. Second time. All right, no problem. <laughs> there we are. So, you know, why politics? Look, I think I think we have to plug some understanding of politics, the geopolitics, the policy, the legislation, the regulatory issues into the corporate strategy. It starts with the economy. And we'll talk about where we see globalization headed, U.S.-China relationship, U.S. election. Then we have to look at the portfolio, right? These trends around fuel prices, environmental policy, and the cost of capital. That's what we deal with with our energy clients all around the world every day. Uh, and geopolitics and policy are a huge factor. Then, of course, how are politics impacting your customers, right? Your rate payers and what they're dealing with, whether it's oil and gas production in the Bakken, whether it's agriculture. And then, of course, we have to look at risk. Not always a popular topic, but I think your, you know, your board and your management have a responsibility to look at how resilient is the business to some of these external threats uh, that could come from global markets or from geopolitics. And then where is Basin heading over the long term? Right? It's easy to talk about the next quarter, the next six months, the next 12 months, but this company has been around for a long time. It'll continue to be around for a long time. And you're also in the long cycle capital business. You're deploying assets that will be here for decades to come. So the longer term trends will be important as well. So every year, our firm Eurasia Group, we publish a top risks for the year ahead. And, you know, to some degree, it's a set of predictions, uh, but it's also really just a way to have a conversation with our clients. And you will be publishing our 2020 risks in, uh, you know, frankly, the first working day after uh, New Year's. But this is what we had for this year in 2019. And don't worry, I won't go through all 10 here, uh, not by no means. I will point out that we did have Ukraine on the list. That would be another presentation, but if you're watching the news, you know that Ukraine has been a huge issue uh, and will be in the US election as well. But I think the ones that really matter here for your market uh, have a lot to do with the US-China relationship, have a lot to do with the global populism trends that are impacting trade and climate policy, and what we call the coalition of the unwilling which is a lot of leaders around the world that are moving away from globalization, economic integration, more towards nationalism and economic fragmentation, which has a huge impact on trade, on agriculture, and on energy as well. So our firm's founder, Ian Brummer, if you like YouTube and Facebook and social media, you can find him there. Uh, he's all over, all over it, has some great content. He wrote a book called The G-Zero World, and you're probably familiar with the G7 group of countries or the G20 group of countries, countries really led by the U.S. that work together to solve big international issues. The hypothesis of his book, which, by the way, was published before Trump, was really that we're moving towards a G0 world. The U.S. is looking more inward. The U.K. is looking more inward with Brexit. And countries and populations and voters are more focused on issues at home. And with 9-11, with the financial crisis, with climate change, there's a lot of frustration about some of the multilateral efforts that have been out there. And of course, Trump comes along 
and we get America first, which is another step in that direction. And it really means that for business and for markets, the way that we've been doing things since World War II with kind of a US-led order, built around things like NATO, the World Trade Organization, the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, didn't always work perfectly, of course, but that was kind of the rules of the road for global business and global politics. Now we're in a different world, and I think we're trying to find out exactly what that new world is, and of course that creates some uncertainty for business and for markets. Political leaders have a big part of it, right? I think, you know, I'm not here to judge President Trump one way or another, but I think we can all agree that he's not a big supporter of things like the Paris Agreement. Uh, he's not a big supporter of the United Nations. He's questioning some of the assumptions around NATO, and maybe some of those assumptions should have been questioned. But America First is not just a US phenomenon. We have a lot of other countries around the world that are focusing more on national interest, focusing more on their own version of America First, whether it's Turkey first with President Erdogan, uh, whether it's Italy first with Salvini in Italy, Saudi Arabia, et cetera. It's not just about Trump. It's not just about the US. We have a number of countries where populism and nationalism in various forms are on the rise. And that's something that has had a lot of impact on the markets going forward. So what does it mean for our US election? Um, if, we th if the election were held today, we think Trump would win. Uh, we have a whole team of people who track the election very closely, look at the polling. But as I mentioned, we cover about 100 countries. And we have a model for uh, about 70 of those countries on elections. And in that election model, the strongest indicator of an election is when you have an incumbent leader with a strong economy. And that's where we're, we are right now in the US. The US key performance indicators, whether it's gasoline prices, unemployment, the stock market, GDP, are all in great shape. So I think that puts Trump in quite a strong position to be reelected. And as long as the economy holds up for the next you know, six to 12 months, that is probably the biggest risk, and I'll talk about that in a little while. I think what also helps Trump right now is where the Democrats are going. You know, I think uh, our US political team about three weeks ago upgraded Elizabeth Warren and downgraded Joe Biden, and we now see Warren as the odds on favorite to win the nomination, but not the election. If you look at the successful Democrat candidates since the Second World War, pretty much all of them have been to the center, whether it's Kennedy, uh, Carter, um, Obama, Clinton, maybe LBJ was the one who was a little bit more to the left on economic issues, but was certainly very uh, conservative on national security issues. The Democrats that have been on this progressive wing, whether it's Dukakis, Mondale, McGovern, maybe John Kerry, they not only lost the election, but they lost them by rather historical amounts. So I think this really, really helps Trump and makes him probably a much stronger candidate to, to get reelected, especially when you factor in electoral college than he would be otherwise. Um, so we, we spend a lot of time looking at these candidates at their policies. And I think when we look at our sector, the energy sector, my sector, I think that the Elizabeth Warren policies, the Bernie Sanders policies around the Green New Deal, around a fracking ban, um, I think you'll agree they're not gonna play well in states like Pennsylvania, Ohio, Colorado, that have significant energy production. And you know that, that I think will be a big factor in the election as well. But what does this really mean for the economy, right? If, whether it's Elizabeth Warren or Donald Trump or what have you. There are a couple of big global issues that I think really matter a lot here to North Dakota, to the Bakken, to climate policy, uh, to oil and gas, uh, and to the economy as a whole, and to certainly to agriculture. The first is China, and I want to spend a few minutes talking about that. And hopefully you can read these probability tables here. So where do we see the China situation going? We know that a few weeks ago, President Trump and President Xi agreed on the so-called phase one of the US-China uh, trade talks. And unfortunately, their plans to sign that deal uh, were actually overturned because it was gonna happen at the um, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation meeting in Santiago. But due to the populist unrest in that country, um, the event was canceled. And yes, there is some irony in that. And I talked about global populism. I mean, Chile is a country that's doing pretty well but they're not big fans of globalization there either. And the protests there made it unsafe for the leaders to go. Nonetheless, I think this deal will be signed, but what's really in the deal? Have we really solved the US-China issues? And the answer is no. 
Uh, the U.S.-China issues will continue to be a source of uncertainty for the energy markets, the agricultural markets, and the economy, I think, for the next few years to come. What we've agreed upon here is, uh, of course, some good news for the agriculture sector. Um, good news in the sense that there will not be additional tariffs imposed on the U.S., but we haven't really had a breakthrough on the more structural issues in the relationship. You know, a lot of these issues that have been agreed upon were actually agreed on under President Obama uh, and just never implemented. But, you know, kudos to the Trump administration for getting um, a delay on the further tariffs and getting some uh, good news on the agricultural purchases. But it's the issues that are in phase two or that are not really being discussed that are the tough ones. And this is when we move from the commercial issues more into the geotechnology issues and into the geopolitical issues. When I say geotechnology, we're really talking about the issues around Huawei and their 5G technology, which of course the US believes should be controlled and regulated because of its potential impact on national security. But we're also talking about the question of who will be the global leader in areas not only like 5G, but also quantum computing, artificial intelligence, technologies that have both commercial and national security implications. The US, not just Republicans, but Democrats like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, believe that China should be contained in those areas because of the way that the state uses those technologies to control their population and potentially to spy on other countries. It's also possible that, God forbid, we ever get a war between the US and China, it'll be these technologies that determines who wins and who loses in the way that nuclear weapons and aircraft carriers and other things did in previous wars. So this is not just a commercial issue by any means. Now, how do the Chinese see it? The Chinese say that Huawei is just another company. It should be treated just like we treat Verizon or you know, uh, Ericsson or uh, Google. And under the World Trade Organization as a member, the US has no right to restrict what they're doing. We're not even talking about that issue between the two countries right now. There's a lot of work to do, but it goes beyond that. Pay attention to these two maps. I hope you can see them here pretty clearly. The one on your left is very blue. That shows the world in 1997. And the blue countries are the countries for whom the US is the, was the largest trading partner. If you look at the other map, you can see it's a lot more red. That map shows the countries who now, as of today, have China as their largest trading partner. I'll let that sink in. This is what this trade dispute is really about. It's not about Trump. Huawei's part of it. Soybeans are part of it. LNG is part of it. But it's really about this. A sense in Washington, in the Pentagon, in the US business community, among certain US allies, that China's economic model is spreading around the world and that's not in the US national interest. That is the issue we're gonna be struggling with the next few years. It's not a Trump issue, it's not a Democrat issue, it's a US issue. And I think you'll see that whether it's Silicon Valley, whether it's unions, whether it's automakers, uh, whether it's uh, Democrats or Republicans, I think this is the issue we have to watch going forward. So I spent some time on China because I think China is the most important issue for the oil market. There's a lot of things going on here. Some are bearish, some are bullish. We'll talk later about how the market's pretty well balanced physically here. But I agree with the gut, what the governor said, that it's amazing that that September 14th attack against the Saudis by the Iranians had such little impact on prices. It's not just because of the US shale, although I agree with him that that's a big part of it. It's also because there's a lot of doubt about the global economy and there's a, a concern in the, the futures oil market that the situation with China is going to get worse. Just to, that is just as much of a reason why prices didn't go up. The markets believe that we have a lot of inventory, that demand is gonna be weaker next year, and that there's not a lot of oil price upside even with that massive attack against the Saudis. So that should be a signal to us to be a little bit cautious in our short-term outlook for oil. Not necessarily over the next two or three years, but in the short term, and I'll tell you why. This chart shows on the far left side the growth in oil demand globally, 2016, 2017, 2018, pretty healthy, especially 2017 and 2018. The middle bars show what was forecasted for global growth at the beginning of the year for oil demand. You can see that 2019 number looked a lot like the previous years. The far side shows actual demand 
as of October, and you can see that the 2019 number has come down quite a bit. Right, so the oil demand is not growing as fast in 2019 as was expected in the beginning of the year, or that we saw at the same pace for 2017 and 2018. Here's the problem, here's why I'm a little bit cautious about oil in the short term. You notice that in the 2020 number here on the far side, the EIA and other forecasters out there like OPEC still are expecting things to be better in 2020. I don't agree. I think 2020 oil demand growth will be a lot like 2019 has been. Why? Because of what I said before, I don't think we'll have a US-China resolution, right? So I think it's not a disaster, it's not a massive recession, it's just not the kind of rapid growth that we saw in 2017, 2018. What does it mean for supply demand balances? Now what this chart shows is that um, as you move towards the 2019 side of the chart, um, what happened in 2018, those blue bars going up, that means we had a big build in global stocks of crude oil, very significant. And that put a lot of downward pressure on prices. That had a lot to do with the huge growth in US shale supply, including here in North Dakota. What it meant was that OPEC cut their production at the end of 2018. Right? OPEC said, we can't have this big stock build, we have to have lower prices, we have to have higher prices and lower stocks. So you can see by 2019, the surplus actually has gone away. So we have macroeconomic concern about US China, but the physical market is actually quite balanced. When there's no barter, that means that supply and demand are pretty much balanced. So that's kind of why we're in the $60 world that we're in today. But again, the market's concerned about where we might be headed on China. There's another wild card here to consider, which is Iran. Now, of course, we know that Iran was the perpetrator of the September 14th attacks against the Saudis. And this map shows the Straits of Hormuz. And some of you may know that about a quarter of the world supply moves through those straits every day. Um, that little tiny strait there between uh, Abu Dhabi and Iran. And you can see that it's surrounded by uh, US, Iranian, Saudi, and UA Air Force bases and, and naval bases. So a very insecure region. And you can also see how easy it is for the Iranians to hit the Saudis with missiles and drones. They can hit them from southern Iraq, they can hit, hit them from Yemen, which is further south in the map, or of course, right across the Gulf um, from Iran. So that's what happened. Uh, we lost six million barrels a day for a few weeks, but there's enough supply out there and soft enough demand that it didn't make a huge difference. I actually think the issue for Iran is a different issue. And the issue, and I really urge you to think about this in terms of your planning for the next two or three years, is probably the biggest single downside risk for the Bakken is that if the Democrats get elected and they decide to go back to Obama's deal with the Iranians, that means we'll be lifting the sanctions on Iran's oil sector, and that Iran exports will go back up to about two and a half million barrels a day, and now surpluses in the global crude market will go up dramatically. I think that's a recipe for a $40 oil price. Now, it's not gonna last for forever, but what would happen is demand's not growing quickly enough, and there's too much supply from other places to absorb that much Iranian oil at once. So let's watch that situation very closely. It's no guarantee, of course, that Democrats will win. We think they'll lose. It's no guarantee that even if, even if they do win, that they'll immediately go back to Obama's deal on Iran. But for the oil market, I can't think of any factor more important than this. Just because of the sheer volume of Iranian oil that's out there into a market that's balanced, but has some bearish indicators as well. Bigger picture, though, I am very bullish on US shale. I'm not sure we can continue to sustain the kind of growth that we've seen over the last few years, but I, I don't see us you know, at all sliding back to where we were you know, seven or eight years ago. But what this picture shows is that the Russians and the Saudis have basically been giving up their market share to make space for US shale barrels. Why are they doing that? Well, they can both afford to, to some degree, um, but the Saudis are basically defending price and not market share. They're saying if we give up some of our volumes, it'll help keep prices higher and make space for the US barrels. But of course, they can't do that forever, right? So I think what the Saudis are banking on, and a scenario that I agree with personally based on my conversations with you know, dozens and dozens of EMP companies and oil service companies, is that we are headed towards a plateau in the US shale, which will allow the Saudis and Russians to take more of their market share back. So what that would imply is that US shale will probably, in my view, 
get up to about 14 million barrels a day, and from about 12 and a half now, and then we'll stay at that level. I mean, that's not, it, it may sound like bad news, but it's really not necessarily, because we know a shell to keep at 14 million barrels a day with those high decline rates, there's still gonna be a lot of drilling, a lot of economic activity, and a lot of electricity demand. And if you get higher prices, you might see the, the, the supply growth coming again. But what we're seeing now is that there has been a deceleration in U.S. light tight oil production from the big number in 2018 to a smaller number in 2019. And I think for 2020, we'll probably be closer to a half million barrels a day of growth. So when I hear you guys talking about a half million barrels a day of growth just in the Bakken, eh, I don't know, that's, that's a lot, maybe over a couple years. <clears throat> the problem is not a political problem for the U.S. shale, it's a financial problem. This chart basically shows um, the red line is the production growth, which has been incredible, as we just saw. But the green line is the capex from the industry. And then these negative blue bars are the free cash flow. And that's the problem. That in a 50 to $55 WTI, you have a lot of producers with a lot of debt in their balance sheets that leveraged up to fund that capex that are not fully recovering and breaking even in a $55, $50 WTI price. So it doesn't mean a collapse. It doesn't mean a 2015 type disaster, it just means a little bit slower. And I would call it a rationalization. Meaning that much like in 2015, a lot of the shale producers are gonna be restructuring. We're gonna see new pools of capital coming in from the super majors, from big private equity shops, and we'll see workovers of some of the more distressed companies, assets going to stronger operators. That just implies a slower production growth picture. Not a, not a disaster, not a collapse, just not the same kind of growth that we've seen uh, in the last few years. So let's get back to politics. This is somewhat of a cheeky uh, title here, but I do ask my clients, do we really consider the US oil and gas sector politically stable? Now, I'm a political scientist, of course I would ask that question. Here's my thesis. <clears throat> we have Donald Trump, of course, who's probably the most pro-oil and gas president we've ever had, um, and then we have potential for Elizabeth Warren, who, who would be unquestionably the most anti-oil and gas president we've ever had. And the Democrats, by the way, you could say what you want about President Obama, but he was pro-oil and gas. He was not pro-coal, <laughs> I'll give you that one. But Obama's war on coal is now a war on fossil fuels under the likes of Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. That's a very different story, and obviously very different from oil and gas. That's where we get the fracking ban discussion from Warren, offshore drilling bans, et cetera. I don't think that either side will win this debate, right? I don't think that Trump will be able to ram through Keystone XL or force California to get fuel efficiency standards he wants, nor do I think that Warren can ban fracking. My concern is one word, it's a stalemate. That the investors that we work with, they want clear policy signals. They would actually almost rather that one side wins, right? That we either have a very strong, clear direction towards pro oil and gas, or we go the other direction and get you know, decarbonization and energy transition. What the investors are really struggling with as they think about funding the Bakken or funding solar and wind projects here or CCS projects here is when are we ever gonna get any direction on this, right? In a hyper-polarized environment in Washington that we've seen in immigration and trade, other areas. Unfortunately, I think that's where we're headed with the energy sector. This election will be pretty bitter on the energy and climate file. And a lot of the action on the energy side is not in Washington, it's in the states, and it's in the courts, and it's in, with the non-governmental organizations and environmentalists, and it's a lot harder to get a sense of where the market is actually headed. So all these different political issues here, I worry about a stalemate quite a bit. So stable, yes, from a macro perspective, we're not Nigeria, we're not Venezuela, that goes without saying, but I worry about some of the policy and regulatory issues getting ground down in the courts. So let's talk numbers. <clears throat> I painted a bit of a more cautious outlook for um, the U.S. shale, and I did look at the study that was mentioned here a couple times uh, that was done for the North Dakota government. Um, look, that, that study, as I understand it, I think they're basically assuming a $75 oil price, and I think if you get that, you'll get those numbers. But if we're in a $60 oil price, this sharp slope of growth for the top, which is the Permian, and the middle, which is basically the Wilston Basin, it'll be a little flatter, that's all. Right, we know that shale is very elastic. We know that the producers reinvest their free cash flow back into drilling. And if there's less cash flow from lower oil prices, you're gonna have a flatter growth curve. 
It doesn't mean I'm structurally negative on the shale at all or the Bakken. I would just be slightly more cautious in my outlook over the next uh, couple of years, given the, the risk of Iran in particular and given the risks around US-China. You know, this indicator isn't quite as indicative, to use a back of a better word, as it used to be. It used to be when the rig count went down, production followed. But now we have rigs that are more efficient, that have quicker turnarounds, that drill longer lateral lengths, that have more frack stages, et cetera. Um, so I think even at this reduced level of rig activity, it's certainly recovered from 2016. Um, but it's not a signal of a massive boom of production, in my opinion. I think you would need more rigs in the field to get you know, 500,000 barrels a day of growth. Um, but it can turn pretty quickly depending on where the market goes. What about gas? I'll talk, long, I'll talk more about the long-term outlook for gas, but I think one of the issues in the short term right now is that we all know that there's a gas surplus in this country, and you certainly see that with your own assets. The U.S. needs to get this gas offshore, and when we're having a trade war with China, one of the victims is the LNG sector. Right? China's the fastest growing LNG market, and we've basically gone to zero on our exports there because of the trade war. Doesn't mean there aren't other markets in Asia that want our LNG, but this is a bit of a risk here to watch as well as this US-China gas partnership. What about ethanol? I don't spend as much time personally on this. You know, I've been in Washington for a long time. I'm, I, mean, I grew up in Canada, but I've been in Washington for a long time. And, you know, I haven't seen any president find a policy pathway that keeps both the energy guys and the corn guys happy. I think that's kind of still where we are here. Um, obviously, in the context of the trade war, Trump made some recent changes here to try to bolster ethanol. Uh, there was some pushback from industry, but I don't really necessarily see these to be huge game changers, but they're definitely a moderate positive for ethanol. To me, ultimately, ethanol is about gasoline prices and what I've been talking about, right? This shows the sales of E85, um, you know, and you can see that when we had that big price spike, uh, 2006, 7, and 8, and then 2011, 12, 13, we had great growth in E85. That had a lot less to do with policy mechanisms, a lot more to do with $4 a gallon. So in my scenario now, if we're kind of in this you know, $50 to $60 range with some downside risk in next year or so, you know, I think that will be a bit of a headwind to ethanol growth uh, like we see in the historical data. Okay, I'm gonna talk for about 15 more minutes then we'll have time for Q&A. And in my last 15 minutes, I'm gonna switch gears to the long term. And I'm really glad I went on the tour yesterday uh, to, to Antelope Valley and DGC because, boy, oh boy, I mean, those are assets that are really in the middle of the energy transition. And I think that what's interesting about DGC in particular is that it's already been through an energy transition. Now, the energy transition we're talking about now is towards lower carbon. The energy transition that DGC, DGC went through was from high gas prices to low gas prices. And I can't tell you how impressed I was and again, I travel, you know, 45 countries. I've got clients in, you know, 13, 14 different countries. Spend time in the Middle East, spend time in Russia, Latin America. I just came from Brazil and Mexico. I'm really impressed that this organization was able to pivot the strategy for DGC towards the fertilizer and the urea and ammonia and, you know, chemical products um, in response to the lower gas price environment. And, you know, I think Maybe this is the national anthem ringing in my head, but what impresses me about this country's energy sector is that, along with my homeland, Canada, of course, um, we are the two countries that can actually make those kind of changes. Right? We have the human capital, the flexible financial markets, the engineering, and the creativity to pivot. There's a lot of other rusting infrastructure around the world that was just left <laughs> because of some kind of market disruption. Right, where big national oil companies or state-owned parastatal bureaucracy like Petrobras or, you know, I would rather bet on you guys and your ability to pivot than Aramco, <laughs> as crazy as that may sound. So kudos to you for, for, for pivoting. I know there's some challenges ahead there, but I think that that's a great opportunity. Now, of course, your coal-fired generation assets, you know, my observation there is that I'm glad I went on that tour because it was a reminder that at the end of the day, coal is just an energy source like any other. <clears throat> And it's neither better nor worse than gas or oil or solar or wind. It's a question of what we do with it, right? And I agree with the government in some countries, you know, it's, it's kind of churn and burn in other, in other countries here, like here and in Canada and one or two other places that's actually produced and combusted responsibly. So it's actually great to see that 
in person on the ground. So thank you again for the tour. So I'll talk a little bit about where I see the long-term oil demand, where I think natural gas is positioned in the, in the energy transition towards lower carbon fuels, where I think some of the opportunities are for North Dakota around biofuels, carbon capture, agro-energy agro um, integration, and carbon offsets. And this key question of access to capital. Is there still funding out there for coal? Is there still funding out there for oil and gas? If so, from whom? Now, I wish we were a little bit closer here because this map is hard to read. But again, this is a little bit tongue-in-cheek here as well. Even if we were in a smaller room, you would have a hard time spotting the countries on this map that are actually hitting their Paris Agreement goals. The, the answer is the two yellow countries are Ethiopia and India that are kind of on track to hit their Paris Agreement goals. The only country that's actually ahead of their Paris Agreement goals is a tiny little country called Morocco. It's a little tiny spot in the center there of blue. I say this because governments talk a lot about climate action, but they're not doing much. All of these countries are either insufficient, highly insufficient, or critically insufficient on hitting their Paris Agreement decarbonization commitments. What are those commitments? Well, for Canada, for example, it's to reduce GHGs by 30% from 2005 levels by 2030. One example. I would tell you the US won, but Trump has pulled this out, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, ultimately, the Paris Agreement is supposed to keep the world in a one and a half degree of warming by 2050 and get us to net zero emissions by 2050, but we're a long way from that. Why? Political scientists talking here. In my opinion, it's not because we don't have the technology. It's because populism and climate policy don't go well together. And that voters in Canada, the US, Brazil, Australia, France, support strong action on decarbonization climate policy, they don't want to pay it, pay for it themselves. Right, people are struggling, they're working hard, they don't have a lot of disposable income. So if French President Emmanuel Macron announces a 10 cent a liter diesel tax to discourage diesel consumption and uh, encourage cleaner fuels, people rioted. It's not because the French are against climate change or denying it, it's because they don't want to pay for it. Especially the working class in France. I mean, Paris is a really expensive place to live. And people, of course, it is France, they do ride a lot there, admittedly. But in this case, they were very upset because they said, we shouldn't pay for this. Let the Chinese, the Americans, and the Indians pay. Why should we here in France pay for it? Especially us, the workers, the people who consume diesel in our construction vehicles, our small businesses, why should we pay? Scrap the policy. And I could go through all these examples. The one country where climate change is a big deal and where there's major action is in China. Why is that? Well, China's an authoritarian country. Populism is not a problem for them. If people riot in China, they get thrown in jail, or worse. So if the government decides which China has to move towards cleaner fuels, they do it. I'll give you a couple of examples. In 2006, China imported zero natural gas, zero. In 2019, they are the second largest importer in the world, 13 years. You could say the same about solar power. 20 years ago, they made zero solar panels. Now they're the number one. That's where they're going to go in electric vehicles. That's where they go in batteries. Why? Because of three reasons. Number one, the air is dirty and nasty there locally. It's not so much about global warming as it is the local mercury and NOx and SOx and air pollutants. Number two, unlike the US, they are still very dependent on geopolitically risky sources of energy from Russia, the Middle East, Venezuela, etc. So they have a strong incentive to shift to cleaner fuels. And number three, and this gets back to the trade issues, China wants to be the Detroit of the 21st century. They want to be the global industrial power in these technologies, which are listed here, many of which have a clean technology energy element, such as new energy vehicles. And they are doing it. They're actually winning this, this debate. Um, and we can talk about the reasons why. But this is one country where I think they are on a rapid path to decarbonization compared to other markets around the world. So what does it all mean for oil demand? <clears throat> Look, these forecasts are all over the place. The key point here is that right now, in my opinion, if we look at the, at the S&P, the S&P 500, and we see that the oil and gas sector used to be 15% of the value, in 2009 or 2007, now it's 6%. It's a very simple reason. It's not because of Obama. It's not because of Elizabeth Warren. Um, you know, it's not because of you know, whatever environmentalists you want. It's because the market right now doesn't like the growth case for oil. 
And that means that they're betting on these decarbonization pathways and these peak demand scenarios for oil and lower demand in the future, meaning less oil needed. For the record, I do not agree with that. I'm an oil bull over the long term, and my own view would be in the top half of this chart, suggesting continued growth for oil. And we could talk about the reasons why that is. One reason is that we have 3% decline every year globally. So just to stay flat, we need 3 million barrels a day of new production. And we still have demand growth of 1% to 1.5%. But the real reason I don't believe in those scenarios is what I just talked about. To get to BP's rapid transition scenario, or the IEA sustainable development scenario, where you have a big collapse in oil demand down to 70 million barrels a day, you would need to see something different from governments than what I just talked about. You would need to see other governments besides the Chinese really aggressively forcing voters towards demand destruction for fossil fuels and massive subsidy of decarbonization, towards the Green New Deal, towards California-style policies. I just don't see it. So I see continued demand for fossil fuels here well into the future. Here's a good example. We talk about the growth for clean energy vehicles, light duty vehicles. This is the latest IEA forecast. You can see the top charts there. We're gonna have some hybrid electric growth. We're gonna have some plug-in hybrid growth. We'll have some pretty impressive battery growth. But even by 2050, look at how big that gray bar is. That's gasoline. So yes, gasoline demand in 2050 will probably be slightly below where it is now, maybe even 10, 20% below. But it's not gonna be all blue. You know, we're not, None of the forecasts I see see 100% clean vehicles by that time frame. So what about these ESG investors, environment, social governance? These are the big Wall Street firms, big European insurance companies, banks, that have decided they need to incorporate environment, social, and governance criteria into their investing. The far side of the chart shows so-called negative screening, which is divestment. And there's about $19 trillion of capital around the world that said, no more coal, just not gonna do it, we're divesting, we're selling. Some of them are saying the same thing about the oil sands, and a smaller group is saying the same thing about oil and natural gas, and moving that direction. But there's a group that's almost just as big that matters more to you guys, which is the $17 trillion group called ESG Integration. All those investors are saying, look, we're still gonna invest in oil and gas and coal, in some cases, electric utilities, transportation. We just wanna invest in the cleanest and best performers. Well, that should be good for the US and Canada better than anyone else because of what the governor said, right? That if we can really demonstrate objectively and scientifically that we're a lower life cycle greenhouse gas producer of any of the power, gas, oil than other countries, then we'll be fine. But if we still have flaring, you know, that, that's where you get in trouble with these ESG type investors. And that's why I think you will see the companies curtailing flaring quite quickly no matter what happens in Washington. But this is a big, important area of action on the energy transition as well. So some of you may not like my sort of cautious short-term outlook for the Bakken, but here's why I like it long-term. What this chart shows is a bunch of oil-producing countries ranked by two criteria. On the left side, how important is oil to their economy? And then on the bottom side, what is their political capacity, which is a Eurasia Group model, which basically measures countries according to their ability to withstand external shocks. So one extreme is Venezuela, very dependent on oil revenue and undiversified, and incredibly weak political capacity, weak political institutions, non-functioning government. Now the Saudis are very dependent on oil in their economy, and they're undiversified, but they may have, and they're not democratic, but they have a very strong government and strong institutions. So we feel like they're less exposed to a long-term decline in oil prices. But look where the US and Canada are. We are neither massively dependent on oil revenue nor suffering with weak political institutions, right? So we can manage this energy transition very, very well. We can do the all of the above strategy. I would rather bet on the US and Canada than on a lot of these other countries. A country like Nigeria, they haven't had a big investment decision since 2011. So if, if there's a view that we're moving towards decarbonization and in the long-term slower oil demand, it won't be the US and Canada, it won't be the Bakken that loses capital, it'll be Nigeria, Mexico, Argentina, Venezuela, and countries that aren't even listed here like Iraq, Iran, and Libya. So I think the OPEC guys will be okay like the Saudis, and I think we'll be fine here in the US and Canada, but I think a lot of these other countries will be in trouble. What about biofuels? Love this chart. When we think about deep decarbonization, one of the scenarios is called Sky. It was written by Shell. 
saying, okay, what would Shell look like? Shell, Shell Oil, a big multinational, super major. What would their world look like in 2050 if we were at that one and a half degree emissions target? And one of their findings was that yes, oil demand would be down, which is the top line, but look at biofuels. And this is why I really would be excited about North Dakota if, if I were an investor. I think that North Dakota and your whole region here in the basin have a tremendous opportunity on biofuels that we've not even begun to tap into yet. Not really, which is crazy to think about how big the renewable fuel standard is alone. But what this is saying is that to get to that one and a half degree scenario, biofuels are going to grow by a staggering amount. And it's not just the actual raw material here, it's the land, it's the universities, it's the agronomists, it's the people. What an asset, right? So I think if I were you guys, I would be thinking about how do you position that part of the economy for this energy transition, because I mean, the numbers speak for themselves. Going back to gas, here's the problem. This is just associated gas. Forget the non-associated gas, right? The sort of standalone gas wells. This is the gas production coming from oil, as was mentioned by a couple speakers already. A lot in the Bakken, a lot in the Permian. We have to export this stuff. I do believe that stranded gas will attract the petrochemical demand. I agree with the governor on that. Obviously, it's great for you know CCGT. Um, but it needs to be exported, either by pipeline to Mexico or to Asia as LNG. Here's the problem. And this is why I'm pretty bearish on gas, more so than oil in the next four or five years. One problem I mentioned already is that we're kind of shut out of the largest LNG market, which is China. The second problem is what you see here is that, yes, India and Southeast Asia have big natural gas demand growth on your left, but man, the coal sector is doing really well over there. And by the way, my other thought when I went to DGC yesterday was like, boy, if you guys could take your technology and license it or share it or partner with the Chinese and Indians and Southeast Asians, they are very interested in coal to chemicals. And there's a lot of know-how you have that I think could be, um, create a lot of interesting conversations in these countries, uh, given the enormous coal resources they have and their desire to monetize them in various ways. But the point here is that on gas, our U.S. LNG is a lot more expensive than coal in somewhere like India or Bangladesh or Vietnam. So it's going to take time to develop those markets. And if it takes time and we're shut out of China, that means our surplus continues in the U.S. and we're in a weak Henry Hub price environment, unfortunately. You probably see these charts all the time. Essentially, we're seeing here that from the national level, of course, we know the growth in natural gas and renewables will dominate new install generation. And coal actually here is not plummeting, it's stable, but obviously down from where it was um, you know, 10, 20 years ago. So I looked into that a little bit, I was curious about coal, given where we are here and who we're talking to. We know that the coal consumption is down dramatically in the power sector, and you feel that in your business every day, but what actually explains the numbers here is that this year's annual energy outlook from the EIA, what they're saying is this. They're saying here, and you can hopefully see this brown line in the middle, is that they're actually saying we're gonna have less installed coal-fired capacity, but higher utilization. That's what this says, right? That the, 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 the more efficient, newer coal plants that have been built will still be needed in this balance. Fewer plants bring a higher cap factor. That's what they're forecasting here, even with this cheap natural gas. So I thought that was a really interesting data point that probably is worth more investigation. Longer term for gas, see I'm talking about energy transition, Here's what this shows. 2017 on the far side, the yellow bar at the top and the little red bar at the top, that's gas demand from 2017. The yellow is overall gas demand globally. The red bar is gas demand from the power sector. If no policies change, you move to the next bar and you see that gas demand grows by about 50% overall and basically doubles in the power sector as well in the current policy scenario. If you go to the far side, to the most decarbonized scenario, there's no gas demand growth, right? That basically says um, overall gas demand and gas demand within the power sector globally is flat. That is a really important issue for this basin and for this state because it gets to the question of, is gas a dirty fuel or a clean fuel in the eyes of the environmentalists? Okay, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders think it's dirty, but you know, the Nature Conservancy and um, 
environmental justice think it's bad. Sierra Club like it. Why? Because they want to replace coal more than anything. So that debate about where gas fits into the fuel mix uh, and into the decarbonization strategy is quite important. My view is this. I think gas will be a winner here and will probably be more in that current policy scenario because gas will actually be a partner to renewables, not an enemy. Elizabeth Warren will tell you it's an enemy to renewables and we need to stop it at all costs. I actually, no, I mean, as you know, if you have wind and solar, gas is, is probably the best firming capacity you can get because of the you know, obvious technical factors. But that is a political debate you have to pay attention to and, and take it seriously, and that is a risk that we have to watch because not everybody agrees with that. So let me wrap this up and then we, I think we'll have maybe you know, almost 15 minutes for Q&A. I mentioned these kind of corporate questions at the beginning about where does politics fit into your, your various segments, your business strategy. You know, I talked about the economy and I think we do need to watch US-China. It will be a headwind to growth, and I think this confrontation will be the new normal. And there is some risk there for energy demand and agricultural demand. Again, it's not that we're going back to a 2009-type crisis. I don't think we're headed for a deep recession. All I'm saying is this. From 1999, when China joined the World Trade Organization, till now, the oil demand tripled. It's not going to be like that the next 20 years. That's the difference between a $100 barrel oil and $60 barrel oil, that's all. But it is a headwind and we do need to pay attention to it. And there will be moments where it's a very negative and strong headwind. As far as the portfolio and fuel prices, I think oil prices are gonna stabilize. Uh, I think that as you saw in my data, I think the shale will slow down. That may you know, not be the news you want, electricity demand side, but it's actually good in terms of, a, of um, the larger oil price, helps keep that market in balance. But I think natural gas is going to get surplus for another four or five years due to those headwinds getting to the Asia market. As far as the Bakken goes, I think it's very stable, right? I don't think it'll get back to the kind of peak investment scenarios that we had, say, in 2012, 2018, but still healthy. Just I'm a little bit short of some of those forecasts that other, others were talking about. On the risk side, I think for base and electric, obviously you're going to pay a lot of attention to the U.S. election, but I would add those Iran sanctions to the list as well because that scenario is the one that would get me back to a 2014 kind of $35, $40 oil price. Wouldn't last forever, but that would be the big supply shock, uh, I think, for 2021 if the sanctions on Iran are lifted. As far as the fracking ban goes, I think it's a risk, but I would say it's like a 5 or 10% chance it actually happens. It's more as a sort of source of doubt and question and cost and hassle for the industry than a real risk, but that's still you know, not an ideal scenario. In terms of the energy transition, I think gas, solar, and biofuels are very well positioned. I worry about these ESG investors and their, their role in coal and oil, but I think the antidote to that is talking about your environmental performance in a scientific and objective way. And I think that from a climate policy perspective, we're in this period of hyperpolarization, and I think industry can do a lot to cool those waters and have more rational discussions like we've been hearing here the last couple of days. So I will leave it there. I think there's some microphones here. Again, I'm incredibly grateful to uh, Base Electric for uh, inviting me out here. I hope you found this helpful and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Let's give a moment for the questioners to gather here. <clears throat> Sir, I think I see a microphone and a gentleman. Clarification questions are fine as well. There's a lot of material there. Going once. Well. Oh, here we are. Yes, sir. This is kind of more of a fun question, I guess. But um, I was very interested in your China US uh, map and where business, the comparison from. 1990 to today, where people's major markets are. Um, and again, this is kind of a political science question, if you will, but, um, you know, America seems to always have this approach of the good guys and the bad guys. And uh, America, of course, is the good guy and China is the bad guy. And China's a, a, a huge country. 
And China, naturally, in my mind, is going to become a power source in this world just because of their size, if anything else. And when we start looking at China, uh, or any other country for that matter, uh, not as the competitive force or as the bad guy, but as a, somebody to work with and to try to, to get along with and uh, uh, improve ourselves as well as uh, themselves. And I, my fear is the, goal, the, the, the nationalization movement that we're seeing is not going to enhance that kind of a philosophy of trying to work with other people. I think it's going to create problems with it. And, and this idea that we can't let China become a stronger country uh, because it threatens the United States I, I, isn't going to take us anywhere. I think it's going to be a, 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 a it's going to be to our, our defeat, so to speak. That's my No, I think it's a great, so, so I think the, the comment was about the U.S.-China relationship and does it need to be adversarial? Are there opportunities for cooperation? And, you know, really the last 20 years, when President Bush was in office, he created the strategic economic dialogue with China, which actually worked quite well, uh, at least for business. Um, I think there's plenty of opportunities for cooperation with China, including in energy and agriculture, most importantly. And that's why I'm intrigued by some of the local opportunities here. But I think the challenge is when you have leaders like Trump and Xi that are basically viewing this more as a zero-sum game, where someone has to win and someone has to lose. Uh, that's when it gets to be more dangerous. And I'm not just blaming Trump, it's just as much President Xi, like he's not going to compromise on things that frankly would be in China's long-term interest to compromise on, right, to get rid of some of the protectionism, to stop stealing intellectual property. Someone once said that China will stop intellectual property, stealing intellectual property when they create their own, right? And actually now there are big tech companies in China that do have intellectual property and actually favor stronger protection and they don't want the, anyone else to steal it. So I think you're asking a great question, but I think right now our view is that we are in more of a period of conflict and it will take some, some probably more pain on both sides before we see compromise. And the pain would really be a slowdown in the economy more than anything, hopefully not something worse. Question over on the side. Yes, Hi. sir. You alluded briefly to new technologies. I just was wondering if you could expand a little bit with the development of solar, which is coming down in price considerably and new battery technologies. You can see Tesla's valuation is very irrational if you just look at it today, but there's clearly a bet that Tesla's battery technology is going to be big in the future. Could you just elaborate a little bit more on how you see that impacting the demand for oil over the sure. both near term and longer term? I mean, Tesla's an interesting one. I had a great conversation with a very large uh, global pension fund about this. And I said, how can you justify being such a big investor in a company that's not returning cash to the shareholders or growing earnings. And they said, you know, we're in a pension business. We have liabilities on a 50-year horizon, right? We have people who hold pensions today that are 50 years away from retirement or 40 years. Um, so we need to have assets in the portfolio that have that kind of maturation period. And he said, you know, for all we know, Tesla could be like Amazon, right? When we invested in Amazon in 1996, everyone said, oh, what is this? These guys aren't making any money. They don't know what they're doing. They're taking on strong incumbents. That's kind of where the, why the capital has been pushed into companies like Tesla. Now that said, I literally have been scouring the earth, talking to super majors, national oil companies, technology companies, economists, governments, about long-term oil demand. And the, the most bearish oil demand scenario I can find is that Shell Sky scenario, which suggests that every single one of those technologies, electric vehicles, batteries, uh, hydrogen, advanced biofuels all come in and hit the oil sector, even that scenario still has 50 million barrels a day in 2070. So let's say that actually happened. My view, and not everyone agrees with me, my view is that the U.S. and Canada will still be part of that 50 million barrel a day market because investors will feel more comfortable putting their dollars to work here than in places like Kazakhstan or Nigeria or Venezuela. Um, and that, that is where I think there's a good long-term story here. As far as those disruptive technologies go, yes. I think we'll see more electric vehicles, we'll see more hydrogen-powered vehicles, um, we'll, we'll see more advanced biofuels and things like aviation um, and shipping. It's just gonna take time. So I think we're still gonna see places like Brazil today had their deep water auction. 
um, and companies spent billions of dollars on assets that are going to have a 40-year life. Why? Because they believe that the long-term oil demand will still be there for what are relatively competitive assets in Brazil. So I'm just not in the peak demand camp. What would cause me to change my mind is a big change in the political dynamic around the world where voters feel much more comfortable imposing costs on themselves to, to decarbonize more rapidly. Haven't seen it yet, but it could happen.